Hi, welcome to Board Gems. This is my weekly video series in which I cover an older board game gem. I teach you how to play it in case you come across an old copy somewhere, and I tell you why it's still a gem today. Why, even though it's an older game, it doesn't mean you cast it aside like yesterday's news. It's still a good game. And this week's game is pretty old. It originally came out in the mid-90s uh, by a French role-playing game publisher, actually, a company by the name of Multisim. But they were, role, they were a role-playing game publisher, and they kind of, you know, tested the waters with, uh, with board games, and they published this game called Mozart à la Bille, or Murder at the Abbey. And it was expensive, and the component quality wasn't very good. Anyway, it didn't exactly set the world on fire. But in the early 2000s, there was a newish uh, board game publisher called Days of Wonder, and they were looking for their initial games to, to add to their catalog. And the founders of Days of Wonder had a vision of making these kind of big, elaborate games, not necessarily complicated, but, you know, they would take, you know, maybe a couple of hours, you know, 90 minutes, two and a half hours, somewhere in that range, and it's really interactive, and it's loads of fun, and it's you open the box, and there's tons of cool components in it. Back in... 2003, uh, they published their first big box games, which were originally published by other companies, uh, but are now published by Days of Wonder. One is called Pirate's Cove, and the other is Motre à la Bille, which became Mystery of the Abbey. They're designed by Bruno Faiduti and Serge Leger, and it for three to six players, the box says ages eight and up, uh, as long as it's like a mix of adults and kids, eight and ups can absolutely play. It's not a very complicated game, but there should be somebody at the table who can kind of keep the game going and know how it works. A, a bunch of eight-year-olds all playing with each other might be a little iffy. And the box says 60 to 90 minutes. I suppose if you were playing a three-player game with the official variant that speeds the game up and everybody was just trying to like go through it as fast as possible. I could see it being played in, a, in an hour. But if you're getting into the theme, if you're getting into the game, and if you're playing with a larger group of people, which is uh, encouraged, then you're looking at maybe a two-hour game. I'll show you how it plays, and then we'll talk about why it's still a board gem today. To set up the game, place the board on the table between the players. Give each player one pawn, and all the players will place their pawn in the chapel. Roll the dice to determine which players last visited the confessionals. The dice have the player colors, and any colors that are not appearing in the game because no player is controlling that color, just re-roll, and place one in each of the confessionals. Roll another die to determine the start player. The start player will get this deck of mass cards. Numbered 1 to 8, they're going to have the deck face up with the 1 on top, and they're going to get the bell. There's a few decks of cards. You don't need to shuffle the crypto cards, they're all the same. You will need to shuffle up the scriptorium cards and the bibliotheca cards. And the event cards. And finally, the suspect cards. Give each player this little fold-up sheet, shows little tips on how to play and a little, uh, little player aid, and also one sheet showing the 24 suspects. And the suspects differ in five qualities. You can see there's three different orders, there's three different, I suppose, ranks, and then each monk is either hooded or unhooded, bearded or not bearded, thin or fat. Each of those monks has one card in the suspect deck. You're going to shuffle up this deck, take one card, and tuck it under the board like so. This is the murderer. This is what everybody's trying to find. Based on what it shows on the board here, you're going to set aside some into this pile, and you're going to distribute the rest of them evenly amongst all the players. Of course, if they have a card in their hand, then they know that's not the murderer, and they can make a note 
on their sheet indicating so. There's something I like to describe to every player. This is very, very important. Because over the course of the game, players are able to ask questions of each other. And if players answer, they must answer honestly. But humans are human and they may make mistakes. So when you're making notes on your sheet, it's very important to differentiate between suspects you've eliminated because you've seen the card versus monks that you've eliminated because of information other players have told you or through your own deduction, because that information might be wrong. If someone records information they got from someone else as fact, then they could then pass on that information as fact to other players. And a false fact can go around the table and everybody thinks the same thing. And it kind of, it can mess up the game a little bit. So just keep that in mind. The game takes place over a number of rounds. And in a three to five player game, each round consists of four turns. Uh, in a six player game, each round is only three turns per player, but players can move further on their turn. But in a three to five player game, each player has four turns, and the start player will mark the turns with the bell. So at the very start of the game, turn one, mass one, the player will move the bell onto the one of this uh, card, and then each player will take a turn starting with the start player. In the three or five player game, a player may move one or two spaces, and spaces are these rooms, including the courtyard and these rooms here. Note the black borders. So you can see, for example, this confessional enters from the chapel, but this confessional enters from the courtyard here. In a six player game, you can move one, two, or three spaces. But each player will, in turn, take their pawn, move it one or two spaces. If there's somebody in that room, they must ask them a question, and then if the room has some function, they would do that function. A lot of these rooms uh, have no function, they're just spaces you have to walk through to get to other rooms. So if a player ends their turn on a space in which another player's pawn is, then they must ask them a question. If there's more than one player in this room, then the player whose turn it is can choose which player to ask a question. And the type of question you can ask is really anything goes. The only rule is that you're not allowed to ask a question in which the answer must be a suspect's name. It could be a yes, no question. It could be a more involved question. It could be any sort of question as long as the answer doesn't involve a player's, uh, a suspect's name. But the question can have a suspect's name. And the rule book has lots of examples. You can do really crazy things. Like you can even ask them, where are you going on your next turn? So the player who is asked a question can either answer it or take a vow of silence. If they take a vow of silence, that's it. Nothing else happens uh, in that exchange. If they answer, they must answer truthfully. Now this can have, because they have to answer honestly, this can have some kind of interesting effects. For example, in the example I gave earlier, if the player asks, where are you going on your next turn? And the person answers, oh, I'm going to the parlor. Then on the next turn, they have to go to the parlor because otherwise they wouldn't have been telling the truth. Now, after they answer the question truthfully, then the person who has posed the question may then pose a question back to the player whose turn it is. And that player cannot take a vow of silence at that point. They asked a question, they must answer a question in return. And then, after there's a possible exchange of information, then, if the room has some special function, then they do that function. And let's talk about the different rooms. So the scriptorium allows you to draw a scriptorium card. These are cards that give you little extra bonuses, uh, like move an extra space or something like that. They're usually pretty small. They're bonuses that either take effect immediately or you can hang on to and use them at the, in the appropriate time. But the Bibliotheca cards are much more powerful. But each player can only go to the Bibliotheca once. You can go to the crypt 
get a crypto card. All the crypto cards are the same. Use this later in the game, in other words, not this turn, to immediately take another turn. You're only allowed to have one of these at a time. So if you have it, if you have one already, you're not allowed to go there. When you enter a confessional, you are allowed to steal a card belonging to the player whose color is shown on the die. If you enter this confessional, you can steal a card from blue, a suspect card. This die indicates the player who had last visited the confessional. So if red were to go in here, red would be able to steal a suspect card from blue, and then you would rotate the die to show red. The cells, you see there's six cells, one for every player color. And a player who enters a cell gets to steal a suspect card at random from the player whose cell that is. And like the confessional, only one pawn can be in here at a time, but with one exception. The owner of that cell, that color, in this case yellow, can always return to their own cell. And if they're able to catch another player in their cell, then this player must do penance. Penance means returning back to the chapel and then skipping your entire next turn praying for forgiveness. So the rule book mentions that there's lots of uh, things you could make players do penance for. For example, making mistakes during the game. I wouldn't do that. It just creates a whole gotcha element to the game, which I don't appreciate. But I will say that event cards that come up sometimes introduce some funky rules. And if a player forgets to follow those rules, then I think they should be expected to do penance uh, as a penalty. The parlor does two different things, depending on whether there are cards still in this pile. If there are cards in this pile, then a player who goes to the parlor simply takes one and adds it to their hand. And this is information that they know nobody else has. If all these cards are gone, because they're in everybody's hands, then instead a player can choose any other player and give one or two qualities of a suspect. So you could say, I want to see a thin suspect, or I want to see a brother Benedictine. And if the player has a card, at least one card, matching that request, then they must show that player that card. If there's more than one, they can choose which one, and they don't have to say there's more than one. And if they don't have a card that matches the request, then they simply say that. The chapter hall is where you can make revelations and accusations, and that's, that's how you score points during the game. While there are still cards in this pile, so there's still suspect cards that no one has seen, the only thing you can do in the chapter hall is make a revelation. And a revelation is where you identify one quality that you declare the murderer definitely has. But you can't do the negative. I mean, you can say not hooded, that means unhooded, but you couldn't say not a brother because there's two possibilities. You have to narrow it down to a single quality that you say the murderer has. And, and that's written down on a piece of paper for the end of the game. At the end of the game, we're going to look at all the revelations and for each one that a player made that was correct, they will gain two points. And for every revelation they made that is wrong, they lose a point. You can always do a quality and a particular value of that, of that quality that no player has done yet. So if a player has said, I think the murderer is fat, then you can't also say you think the murderer is fat. But you could say you think the murderer is thin. You could say the opposite. Now when this deck runs out, it introduces a new possibility because now all the cards are out in play except for the murderer. And so it is possible to deduce who is here. And so another thing you can do instead of making a revelation is make an accusation. An accusation is declaring which of the 24 monks you believe is the murderer. You declare it and it's written down. And then if another player or any player has that card in their hand, they show it. And that player who made that incorrect accusation will lose two points at the end of the game. 
but if no player has that card in their hand, then it must be here, unless you did something horribly wrong. And then you reveal, and if you're correct, you will gain four points and the game is over. So, like I said, at the end of the game, you're going to look at all the revelations and the accusations that were made by all the players. For every incorrect revelation, minus one. Every correct revelation, plus two. Every incorrect accusation, minus two. The one correct accusation, four. And the player with the most points wins. After each player has performed one turn, then the start player will move the bell to space two. And each player again takes one turn, then moves to three. Each player takes a turn. And assuming it's not a six player game, there will be a fourth turn. And then after the fourth turn, after every player has taken their fourth turn, the start player rings the bell. And all players, wherever they are, must return to the chapel for mass. Each player will pass a number of suspect cards to their left neighbor. And after the first mass, that'll be just one card, but in the second mass, it'll be two and three and so on. So as the game progresses, more and more uh, cards will be passed. You'll see more and more new cards over the course of the game. And then finally, draw an event. The event will often change the rules of the game slightly or introduce a new restriction for players. And then afterwards, this card is discarded and pass this deck, now with the two card, to the start player's right. So the start player is actually going to rotate counterclockwise over the course of the game. And also pass them the bell. And again, starting with turn one. And continue like that until someone makes the correct accusation and total up the points and the player with the most points wins. That's it. You're ready to play Mystery of the Abbey. To me, Mystery of the Abbey is sort of the perfect Days of Wonder game because it's big, it's kind of long, but it's really interactive. Players can get into the theme, they can laugh, they can you know, enjoy each other's company, enjoy the game. Not that complicated. Definitely adults and kids can play together beautiful components unnecessary to add a little bell but i'm so glad they did because it just it just adds something to the game that you realize when you're playing the game that this game is special after their what i would say would be moderate success with, with mystery of the abbey a uh, days of wonder kind of went back to the well designer serge leger co-designer serge leger went back to that well and this time working with uh, antoine bauza uh, designed another Days of Wonder murder mystery game called Mystery Express. Whereas I described Mystery of the Abbey as a moderate success, Mystery Express was definitely not. <laughs> I would describe that as a flop. I have the game, I like the game, but it's one of those games that it's it's hard to say who it's for because the components are great, it's beautiful, uh, it's long so it's one of those days of wonder games but unlike mystery of the abbey it's kind of complicated and it feels very serious whereas this feels very lighthearted. so i think that was about maybe 2010 so afterwards instead they decided to reprint mystery of the abbey in around 2012 uh, same basic edition has the expansion mixed in but the expansion is just a, you know some cards uh, to mix in with the rest of the cards and uh I have to say, I think it was a moderate success again, such that now, I mean, it's almost 10 years later from the last printing. So nine, 10 years later, um, is definitely sold out. There are lots of people still looking for it. So it's, I hope that Days of Wonder will reprint this, that it's a game that's permanently in their catalog because it's a really great fun game. So it can best be described and has been described as a combination of Clue and Guess Who. Of course, that sells the game short, and it's longer than both those games. Longer than both those games combined. Guess Who's not very long. Um, but it's a full-on board game, and it's, it's a real event when you play it, right? When you sit down at the table and you set it up, and everybody's asking questions of each other. Um, it just, 
like that's the main game of the night, right? You're not going to play a bunch of fillers or whatever and you know fit this in in between. Oh no. Now, who is this game for? It's light enough that families can enjoy it. And it's almost an ideal family game in that it's one that kids and adults, so it really works well to, uh, for them to play with each other. Of course, hobbyists can enjoy it with each other as well, um, but I would definitely say it's more on the family side. Definitely it's best when played lightheartedly and with um, an eye toward the theme. Now, the theme... This game was designed in France, and Days of Wonder is a French-American company. And I know there's lots of monasteries in France, not as many in Canada. So it's hard for me to judge like how, how well the game fits the setting. I will say the game does try really hard to get people into the theme, including with some kind of bizarre events that require people to kind of chant their way through, through the next round, um, which people will either love or hate. Um, I would say hobbyists probably would kind of more on the hate side. <laughs> if you're a hobbyist, you can take that event out. But uh, especially if you're playing with kids or just people who are young at heart, uh, keep that in. Uh, it's just goofy fun. So I will say it is a family game, but at the same time, it's a really long family game. Uh, the last game I played of this was a six-player game, and it took well over two hours. I want to say something like two and a half hours, maybe. You know, but the game does speed along. Like, the game does feel like it gets faster as the game goes on because at the start, everybody starts with just one... Well, they start with a hand of suspect cards. And at the end of the first round, they pass one to their neighbor. So, okay, probably you're getting a new card and you get to see it and eliminate that suspect. But at the end of the second round, you're passing two. End of the third round, you're passing three, and so on. So more and more cards are being seen by new people. And so the game can kind of speed up toward the end. And that's really great. It's really important. Because when you're playing a long game, the last thing you want is to feel like the game is dragging. But if the game is long and it feels like it's kind of building, or there's tension, so you feel like you're getting closer and closer to the end, and the question is, well... Will you do what you got to do before the other players do, before the big kind of finale? Um, that's great, right? Adds a lot of tension. And it's a long game, but it, as it speeds up towards the end, it, it gets more exciting. The game box is three to six players. Um, it's kind of natural state is three to five. There's kind of special rules for six players uh, that each player gets fewer turns, but they can do more. They can move farther on their turn. And they actually suggest if you want to play a kind of a fast game, just play with those rules. Play with the six-player rules with any player count. So there's fewer turns, but you can move farther on your turn. Uh, it'll make the game go a little faster. And because the game is long, it's not that I encourage that variant. I always like to play with whatever is the base games, right? If they say at the end of the rule, it's like, oh, you can try this variant, I'm usually not interested because I want to see the game as the designers and the publisher intended it to be as sort of the main experience but i will say if it helps you get the game to the table do it because the game does benefit from multiple plays it's a little bit strange about the free form questions that's the big game that's the main part of the game right is coming up with the questions you're trying to come up with questions that help you but everybody hears the questions everybody hears the answer so you don't want to ask a question that also gives away too much information and it can be tricky to kind of find that balance. So the game benefits from playing multiple times. But because the game is long, that can be hard to do. In my opinion, the game would probably be best with four or five players. Uh, I don't know that I've ever played it with three. Um, it would mostly be fine, I would think. Of course, you you're have less variety in terms of... Uh, the questions and as you're passing more and more cards you're going to get cards you've already seen back um so i probably wouldn't recommend it for three but that's not based on experience that's just a gut feeling i would aim for four or five and six players does work especially with the sped up rules but the game will be long It'll be really long so i think four or five is is its sweet spot so over the course of the game, you can go to the chapter hall and you can make a revelation. You can record publicly one fact that you have figured out about the murderer. And it might not be true. You'll lose a point if it's false. But So you can guess. You can take a chance. 
you can kind of get a feel for it. It's like, okay, I think it's this, and then go get that revelation in before other players. Now, the game is a little bit susceptible to group think because when you're making a revelation, you're recording that publicly, and everybody gets to hear that revelation. People, especially people who are new to the game, can kind of start with an impression that, oh, maybe I shouldn't make revelations. I should just save my information that I've, uh, that I've learned kind of close to my chest if I can and not actually uh, make a revelation. So I make a revelation, yes, if I'm right, I'll score some points at the end of the game, but everybody hears that. And then that maybe tips off somebody else and then maybe they'll get to the accusation, the, the final question uh, before I do. The game is not better that way. Um, if people, if everybody kind of feels that way, to me, the game kind of suffers a bit. Um, the game is best when lots of people are making revelations, right? So somebody guesses that they're thin and somebody guesses they're a Templar and somebody guesses they're a father and somebody guesses they're not a father, they're a novice. And I think it's more fun that way anyway. The scores can be low and that's one of the reasons why I say this, because if just somebody makes an accusation, a correct accusation, that's the only points that are scored, that's no fun for everybody, right? But if lots of people are making re revelations, even if some of them are wrong, then the scores kind of vary a bit. You can play this game uh, in kind of a more, a less chaotic way, because Bruno Faiduti as a designer uh, differs quite a bit from Serge Leger in that Bruno Faiduti loves kind of just wacky chaos all over the place and you don't know what's going to happen next kind of thing. And if you don't like that, you can turn that down. It involves getting rid of the Biblioteca cards so you don't have the extra powerful cards. You don't have the event cards and you're limited on how many Scriptorium cards you have. Scriptoriums are like the, the little uh, extra bonuses, but there's a limit on how many you can have. You can totally play that way, but and I don't mind getting rid of the Biblioteca cards, but the event cards, um, you know, it's funny, I'm not really a big fan of event cards in games. Like if there's a game and it has an event card expansion, just keep that away from me, I'm not interested. Um, but for a game like this, where well, you want to kind of spice it up from round to round, make every round a little bit different. And uh, it just adds a lot, like I said, especially uh, for the theme and setting, uh, to have these kind of things happen. It's just, it just adds up the fun factor, right? And there's another thing about the event cards, because that has to do with penance. So penance is a rule in which if a player makes the wrong accusation, if they accuse somebody of being the murderer, but another player does have that card in their hand, then not only will the player who made the false accusation lose two points at the end of the game, but they have to do penance. And penance is simply go to the chapel and skip your entire next turn. You can also get penance for being caught in another player's room, another player's cell. Um, so that's another way you can get penance. And the rules actually suggest that you can, if you want to, give out penance in other ways. So if a player has a responsibility, like moving the bell from round marker to round marker, and they forget, um, make them do penance, right? For some groups, that's going to be a lot of fun. I don't like that. It adds a bit of a gotcha element, which doesn't feel like it's just not fun for the person who got got. Right. If like, I just have, I mean, I have a poor memory. If I'm responsible for something, I'm likely to forget. And then somebody points, ah, I got you. And then it's like, oh, and then I got to do penance. Right. And some the same player gets picked on. They keep making mistakes and they keep doing penance. That's no fun for them at all. Um, so I don't recommend dishing out penance to players who just make easy mistakes that anybody could make. I do think it's fun when the event, and that's why I like to, to keep the events in play, is when the event introduces new rules, like, oh, now everybody has to do this, or now nobody can do this. And then if somebody forgets that rule, and they accidentally do that thing, then they can do penance. I'm okay with that. And it actually works really, really well with a mix of adults and children. If the adults don't give penance to the children, but the children are allowed to give penance to the adults, oh, that's so much fun, right? So the, you know, if the adults make a mistake or something and the kid's like, ah, I got you, right? And then 
it's fun to send the parent or whomever off to the chapel to do penance, and, you know, and that person's like, you know, of course the adult can kind of ham it up a bit, right? Oh no, I'm so sorry, please forgive me. The game can be a little bit fragile if players don't take care. And so I usually give a little uh, speech at the beginning to try to make sure this doesn't happen, try to head it off at the pass. You see, you can eliminate suspects because you see the card, but you can eliminate suspects in other ways too. You can eliminate suspects by the questions you ask other players or just through deduction. What happens is, especially with the posing questions, because the questions are quite freeform, right? Now, if I ask a question to somebody and say, you know, did you eliminate Emmanuel? And they say yes. Everybody hears that. So everybody's like, okay, so they, maybe they eliminate Emmanuel. But... What if that person made a mistake? They could have eliminated that suspect due to deduction, right? Or, or just making a mistake, or maybe they marked the wrong person. And suddenly that false fact is taken as fact by every other player. And it can kind of mess the game up. <laughs> That's easily avoided. You just say this at the beginning of the game. When you're eliminating suspect, use a different method, mark it differently if you have eliminated it for a fact because you saw that suspect card with your own eyes. Mark that differently from suspects that you've eliminated based on other players' information they've given you or through your own deduction. So you're separating ones that you know for a fact versus ones that you think are fact but you could be wrong about, right? I find that really helps, to be honest. Just just as long as players kind of take care and make sure that information that's not known 100% doesn't get passed off as 100% fact to the other players, um, that pretty much avoids the problem entirely. Now, of course, the game gets compared to Clue. Why wouldn't it? There aren't that many murder mystery deduction board games. I mean, I guess there's lots of murder mystery games, but I mean, like in board game form, not that many. So, does it replace Clue? This used to be important because the games that everybody knew were Monopoly and Risk and Clue. And so you as a hobbyist were trying to introduce, you know, people to better games or newer games. And you'd find the game that replaced the old game. Oh, you love Monopoly? You have to play Catan. It's, it's much better. You'll love it, right? So, you know, there's lots of replacements for Risk. What about Clue? What replaces Clue? Does Mystery of the Abbey replace Clue? Yes and no. Not 100%. Because even though Mystery of the Abbey is a great game, it is longer than Clue. And it's more freeform, whereas Clue has a bit more, um, it's a bit more strict in how, because you don't really ask freeform questions. You There's specific format. You know, I suggest suspect in location with this weapon and then it goes clockwise around the table there's there's a very firm methodology that gets resolved in the game and this one is much more wide open but it's also longer so just because somebody likes clue doesn't mean that if they played mystery of the abbey they would fall in love with mystery of the abbey and never play clue again um clue still will have its fans and Mystery of the Abbey doesn't necessarily steal them away. For hobbyists, though, sure, this is a much better game than Clue, and it's, a, it's still a great game today. Now, it is a little bit hard to find now. I hope that Days of Wonder keeps this in their catalog. There are a number of older games. There are games that they've reprinted, and Mystery of the Abbey is one of them. It's one of their early games that came out in 2003-ish, and then they reprinted it in 2012. Um, but there are games that they probably won't reprint or have already moved on to other companies. Uh, other companies have published new versions of Colosseum and Cleopatra. I hope that Mystery of the Abbey stays with Days of Wonder, that Days of Wonder uh, commissions a new printing for it. It could even be exactly the same. It's totally fine. It doesn't have to be improved or added upon at all. Just keep it in their catalog. Make it available for people because... It is a really unique game. There aren't that many murder mystery deduction games out there. 
and some of them are not that great. <laughs> Mystery of the Abbey is a great one, though. And if you love murder mystery, if you love deduction, if you don't mind a long game, if you don't mind a, a kind of a family game, you know, it's not very complicated to learn. Maybe you don't mind a bit of chaos, you know, crazy events happening. Um, and like I said, it's, it works especially well with a mix of kids and adults. So these are all reasons that you may want to consider Mystery of the Abbey. Thanks for watching. Remember, older games like Mystery of the Abbey don't stop being good just because new games come out. Take care.